morning, everyone. Good morning. Um, so I'll get started. So for those who don't know me, my name is Katie Wing. I'm one of the Cornea Fellows. And today I wanted to present about the surgical management of peripheral ulcerative keratitis. And I should clarify that actually we try to avoid surgery as much as possible in these cases, but I wanted to talk about situations in which you may not be able to do that. So let's go to the case that prompted this thought process. We had a 30-year-old African-American male who presented to our clinic in April of 2018 with discomfort in the right eye for two weeks. This is a photo of his eye, of his right eye. His vision was actually 20-20 and his pressure was normal. But as you can see here, he had conjunctival and scleral injection leading up to the limbus, an area of peripheral crescentic ulceration that also had an epithelial defect overlying and stained with fluorescein. So he clearly does have PUK. Now, why does he have this condition? We actually performed a full workup, and uh, his review systems was negative. We sent laboratory testing, which was negative for ANA, rheumatoid factor, ANCA, you know, infectious conditions such as quantiferon, treponemal testing, sarcoidosis. And we actually um, eventually did also perform swabs of the area of ulceration that were negative for HSV, VZV, PCR, and bacteria. His chest X-ray was negative, no hilar lymphadenopathy to suggest sarcoidosis. And uh, we unfortunately were not able to obtain a family history as he was adopted. Um, but ultimately, it seems like this is probably an undifferentiated case of PUK, so not related to a systemic inflammatory condition, but clearly still vision threatening. So he was actually lost to follow up for a few months after this point. He came from Wyoming um, about 10 hours away, and uh, I think that contributed a lot um, to that loss to follow up. But he eventually did come back in July 2018 as well, still with discomfort. And as you can see here now, his vision's 2150, pinhole 2100. And if you compare the photos from April 2018 to July 2018, you can clearly see progression towards the central visual axis of this area of ulceration. So he clearly has worsening disease. We actually initiated oral steroids immediately, um, high dose, especially given that his infectious workup was negative. And we referred him to rheumatology, who saw him within the week and who recommended rituximab, given the severe nature and vision-threatening nature of his condition. Unfortunately, there were insurance delays in getting it rituximab approved for this patient, and thus a month passed, and then he came back in August for a routine exam. He complained of you know, worsening vision for the past few days, and he had a flat anterior chamber at that moment. So clearly he's perforated. This is not good. And in terms of where the area of perforation was, it appeared that actually in the inferior area um, of that um, crescentic ulceration, uh, there was a corneal flap already overlying, an area that was probably previously Cydel positive, although currently was Cydel negative. So we elected at that point not to glue that area given that it already self-sealed to avoid manipulation of the area. But we did recommend inpatient admission um, for a media IV solumetral, as well as inpatient initiation of rituximab, given that it'd be easier to obtain as an inpatient. So what has happened to this patient afterwards? Well, I'm gonna leave you guys in suspense. We'll go back to this patient at the end of the presentation. But first, I wanted to go over a few questions that you know, appeared in my mind when um, this patient presented. The first is, in these cases of PUK, how often does perforation happen? And if medical management, such as gluing or um, high-dose immunosuppression in inflammatory cases doesn't work, what are the surgical outcomes if you need to do an emergent graft? And what are the surgical techniques utilized in these circumstances? So let's go over our first question, which is how often does perforation happen in these cases? So this was a retrospective case series of patients who presented to a single center in Bristol to an ocular inflammation specialist of all cases of PUK over 2002 to 2012. Um, the authors excluded infectious etiologies of perforation. These were only in inflammatory cases of PUK. There were 85 eyes total, and 11 actually upon perforation were already perforated. Five out of those 11 were initially attempted to glue, and the other six out of 11 went immediately to surgery, although all eventually required surgery. So even those five patients in which it was attempted to glue, um, the authors were not able to obtain anatomical success on that method. 
And my interpretation from this is that actually 11 out of 85 is higher than I would have expected. Um, but granted, this is um, these are patients, excuse me, presenting to an ocular inflammation specialist, so probably actually already referred from other ophthalmologists. So this may not be the general, you know, PUK population, um, not at this tertiary center. And if let's go to our second question, which is if medical management doesn't work, what are the surgical outcomes? So this was an analysis of 32 eyes, also a retrospective case series from 1980 to 1994 of all corneal perforations related to rheumatoid arthritis that presented to more fields. There were 32 eyes total. And in terms of the success, zero out of six patients who got glued had anatomic success, as in the globe integrity was able to pres be preserved on that alone. Three out of four patients who had lamellar keratoplasty had anatomic success. And 10 out of 22 patients who had PKPs had anatomic success. So my interpretation of this is that gluing really doesn't seem to be too successful, um, at least in this case series, although grafts, at least in some cases, were able to reinstate globe integrity. Actually, the graft success was also lower than I would have anticipated. But that being said, um, these are patients who are actively inflamed. And furthermore, um, the period of time, 1980 to 1994, is before we had a lot of the newer um, immunosuppression that, were, that is available today. For example, rituximab was not available then. So I think that this may not be applicable to uh, today's um, breadth of immunosuppression. Now, this was actually a um, re uh, retrospective uh, study of all corneas needing keratoplasty for tectonic indications, including infectious trauma, trauma, inflammatory, among others, from 1991 to 2009 in the Singapore National Eye Center. And the authors analyzed tectonic failure, aka anatomical failure, loss of the globe integrity, and physiologic failure, aka loss of graft clarity. There were 362 eyes who presented who needed keratoplasty for tectonic indications in this time period, which is almost 20 years. Now, when the authors performed a multivariate logistic regression, they found that factors that were associated with tectonic failure was actually lid disease, which was surprising to me, as well as receiving a lamellar graft or peripheral graft as compared to a central penetrating keratoplasty. Now, with regards to the type of graft, the authors did note that patients with inflammatory conditions tended to get the ALKs and the peripheral grafts versus those with infectious conditions tended to get more of the central PKs. Um, so I don't think that the populations are totally equal, and I actually don't think that's really captured in this multivariate analysis. So it's hard to say what to make of the data regarding the type of graft. But I do think that the lid disease data is actually really interesting because that's not something that I would typically you know, care about or think about um, if a patient presented with um, needing a tectonic graft. But perhaps that is something that we actually should think about. When the authors looked at risk factors for physiologic failure, they found that inflammation uh, was definitely a risk factor for physiologic failure, which makes sense and is what we would expect. And they also found that greater graft size, greater than nine millimeters, was associated with decreased uh, graft success. Now, there's two ways, I think, to interpret this data. The first is that um, a larger graft is closer to the limbus and thus perhaps more risk of rejection. But that being said, I think perhaps those patients with more severe disease required the greater graft size. So I think that once again, it's hard to know what to make of this data in terms of the graft size. So let's say someone does need um, a surgical graft. What are the surgical techniques utilized? So for this patient, recall, he had a perforation that we think was inferior. You know, do we do a large diameter PKP? Do we do a small eccentric uh, circular graft? Are there other shapes that we can do? Actually, when you look at the literature, there's really a wide array of techniques that have been utilized, um, very varied, um, for uh, repairing these patients. So techniques described include large diameter grafts, sclerokeratoplasties, eccentric small grafts, biconvex, crescentic grafts, no star-shaped grafts, unfortunately. So this was actually a study that looked at large diameter grafts. So recall we talked about large diameter grafts earlier. Um, and this study was actually a retrospective case series that looked at 35 eyes with large diameter grafts at one institution 
Um, large diameter in this study was defined as 8.75 millimeters or above, although I've also seen it defined as nine millimeters and higher. For reference in the OR, I've seen that we t have tended to use about eight to 8.25 millimeter grafts um, for a normal patient. Um, this study actually was in non-inflamed eyes, so eyes with keratoconus and pellucid. And the authors argued that actually at follow-up, 33 out of 35 patients were without graft failure. And also that um, they had fairly good astigmatic outcomes. So what the authors, you know, what they wanted to show a point of in this article was that large amber grafts are not so bad. I don't know if this really would apply to an actively inflamed patient, but once again, perhaps in a patient with active inflammation, maybe a large diameter graft is really your only option. Now, another technique described is sclerokeratoplasty. So let's say you have a patient with a large central corneal ulcer that extends into the sclera, causing scleral necrosis. Um, what do you do in that instance? So this was a study um, that described a technique whereby you actually get the entire globe from the eye bank, you fixate the globe, uh, then you use a 14 millimeter tree fine to uh, make a mark onto the sclera. Then you do a partial lamellar uh, scleral dissection that extends 0.5 millimeters onto the peripheral cornea, and then use a full thickness 10 millimeter tree fine to punch a full thickness uh, corneal button. Now the recipient is prepared the same way using the 14 millimeter tree fine, and then the 10 millimeter tree fine, and then the two ends are sewn together. And it's thought that this method can preserve the um, angle and thus hopefully lead to less chance of glaucoma in the future. Now this study actually looked at eccentric round small diameter grafts, so grafts that are off center but round. And this was a retrospective case series that looked at seven patients with eccentric small grafts for various conditions, for example, inflammatory conditions, but also corneal wound burns, et cetera. The grafts were 3.0 to 5.5 millimeters in diameter. Follow-up mean was 21 months. And at follow-up, four out of seven patients had no significant irregular astigmatism, although three out of the seven did have irregular astigmatism. Um, all graphs had anatomic success. So the author's point that they were trying to make in this paper was that you know, small eccentric graphs um, are able to succeed and um, may even not cause significant irregular astigmatism. However, what if you're worried that a small graft, even if you place in the periphery, you know, the sutures are still gonna cross the visual axis? What are some other options? So other techniques described in the literature include crescentic grafts, and as you can see here, the pupillary axis is spared, or biconvex grafts, as seen here. And there are various techniques described in the literature um, for how to harvest these grafts um, accurately. So we went over a few questions, which is how often does perforation happen in these cases? If medical management doesn't work, what are the surgical outcomes? And what are some surgical techniques that have been described in the literature? So back to our patient, recall that he had perforation and inpatient admission. He received IV solumedrol that day and also started rituximab two days later. And actually, his AC reformed, uh, which was great as he did not require surgery and he was continued on an oral steroid taper. This is him actually November, so a few months later. And he looks actually really great. Um, his vision is 2200, pinhole 2060, uh, likely because of the irregular astigmatism and also central nature of the uh, area of prior ulceration. Um, and he's quiet. He has no scleritis, no active PUK. His AC is quiet. And I think an interesting question is in the future, um, when and if he may be a candidate for a PKP for visual indications, so not, not tectonic, but visual indications. So there's actually not a lot of data regarding this, you know, Literature does describe how some patients may get you know, a tectonic graph because of active PUK that's perforated, and then later on they get a visual uh, rehabilitation graft, but there's no real data on a patient who's quiet just doing a graft for visual rehabilitation. So I think in the end it will be a judgment call as to when and if and how to immunosuppress this patient um, around the time of maybe him wanting or being a candidate for a visual, uh, visually restorative graft. Thank you so much, and that's the end of my presentation. Okay, thank you so much.
I apologize. I, I didn't get a chance to introduce Katie. She kind of snuck up here, but I'll take a second just to introduce Brock, uh, one of our glaucoma fellows. So Brock came to us from Oregon, um, and we're really excited to, to have him here. He's been great on call, just speaking from a pre resident's perspective. We just love having both him and Katie here. So I'll turn the time over to Brock. All right, so thank you for the introduction. Um, so when I uh, was deciding on what kind of topic to present, uh, I, I kind of pulled the residents to see uh, what they think would be the most interesting and, and beneficial to them. Uh, and I kept, the, the recurring theme kept being that, you know, there's so many MIGs, um, how do I make sense of them? Uh, and then how do I apply this to, to practice and where, where, what's the role of MIGs? Um, so glaucoma is a leading cause of irreversible blindness in the world. The only modifiable risk factor for glaucoma is lowering IOP. Um, traditional treatment algorithms are typically start with medications, then we do laser, then we do surgery, typically trabeculectomy or uh, glaucoma drainage devices. Um, the problem is that the laser effect is only temporary, and uh, we have high complication rates with our traditional glaucoma surgeries. Um, you know, over 30% for trabs and tubes with reoperation. Uh, of over 20% in the TRAB versus tube study. So uh, anybody that does glaucoma surgery is familiar with complications. Um, so these are just a, a few of the complications that we see with trabeculectomy from the uh, TRAB versus tube study. Um, so I'm not going to go down the entire list, uh, but suffice it to say that the complications are, are very, very common. Um, so even though MIGS uh, have an increasing role in glaucoma management, um, none have matched trabeculectomy or tube shunts uh, for lowering IOP. Um, and so despite these complications, uh, unfortunately, TRABs aren't going any away anytime soon. Um, so I think that it's important that we not lose sight of that and, uh, and that the role that MIGs have. And the other thing is that MIGs kind of come and go, uh, as we know, with side pass. Uh, but trabeculectomy has really kind of remained a, a big part of management since the 1960s. Uh, and then there are some people that argue uh, whether or not MIGS uh, stands for minimally invasive glaucoma surgery versus minimally effective glaucoma surgery. Um, so, and then the other thing is this is not a comprehensive review. I'm, uh, I'm kind of giving a, a general overview uh, and just kind of some pearls of, of different MIGS and kind of how they uh, are, are fitting uh, into uh, our treatment. Okay, so the cardinal features of MIGS, um, you know, this is an ab internal microincisional approach. Um, the exceptions are in-focus micro shunt, which I'll talk about later, which is an ab external approach, uh, and that there's minimal trauma and disruption to normal anatomy and physiology. They have demonstrable and reliable IOP lowering uh, with an extremely high safety profile, rapid post-op uh, recovery, and minimal need for follow-up. So basically, the polar opposite of trabeculectomy uh, is what we're after here. Um, so unfortunately, the reality is that there's really no free lunch. Um, Zen, which I'll talk about in a little bit, uh, has neat needling rates as high as 47% uh, in the literature. Uh, hypotony is still problematic with, with some of the MIGS procedures, uh, especially uh, SIPAS, which is no longer with us. Uh, and then uh, also having the sudden unpredictable IOP spike with the cleft closure of SIPAS, uh, which you can see in the, in the top right-hand photo here. This is just the psychodialysis cleft. Uh, and then, you know, even these eye stents, which you think are, can be, you know, especially benign, um, you can cause an iatrogenic psychodialysis cleft. Um, so this is, you know, not something that, you know, is, is completely foolproof. Uh, also, the hyphema rates are over 30, uh, can be over 30% with GAT, uh, and I've seen some really impressive hyphemas uh, here today. So these are, these are not necessarily, you know, minimally invasive. Um, so the MIGS role, um, so basically it's reducing IOP uh, as well as the medication burden. Um, so, you know, these, these medications come with a lot of side effects. Um, you know, getting the medications inside the eye is very challenging. If you've ever actually watched your patients uh, instill a drop, you'll see, uh, you'll, you'll uh, learn a lot. And you'll, you'll see that, you know, a lot of these patients just, they can't tolerate the drops and they can't even get them in the eye. Uh, and then just a couple uh, of side effects here we have on the left, we have the prostaglandin associated orbitopathy and then uh, the familiar follicular, follicular reaction that we see with our alpha agnus. Um, so generally they're less, infect, uh, less effective in lowering IOP than traditional traps and tubes, uh, but they do kind of fill the gap between patients needing 
uh, lower IOP without warranting the, the high risks of, of these traditional trabeculectomies and tube shunts. And so these are generally um, used for mild and moderate glaucoma. Um, so as you see in the middle, these are the patients that we're really targeting with our MIGS procedures. Um, they're not for advanced uh, patients and, and really um, not necessarily for our ocular hypertensive patients. Um, so there's really, there's so many options. Um, so we have our uh, trabecular outflow targets. We have our eye stent, our trabectome, hook dual blade, hydrus micro stent, aventurinal canaloplasty, trab 360 trabeculotomy, our GAT, and then we have our, our uh, supracoroidal, uh, which are side pass, which is no longer here, and then the eye stent supra, which is uh, awaiting FDA approval. And then we have our Zen, our in focus. Uh, the Zen is here. Uh, the in-focus is uh, currently approved in Canada, but is currently awaiting approval here. Uh, and then we can target or aqueous production with our ECP. So, um, you know, just even within the last five years, we've got a lot of new arrows in the quiver, but kind of where, where do they fit, uh, and how do, we, how do we make use of all these devices? Um, so just kind of starting into a general overview so that you kind of have a general sense of how these devices work. Um, so the iStent uh, is one of the, one of the first um, that that came out. So this is an ab internal uh, insertion of these micro stents into Schlem's canal. Um, so you can see that I've kind of uh, tried to sort out the just the average IOP reduction uh, from all these devices. Um, so it was 8.4 at two years uh, with the original eye stent, which you see on the top right, and then 8.1 at one year um, with the uh, with the new eye stent inject, uh, where you implant two of these eye stents uh, in the trabecular meshwork. Uh, so these were actually randomized control trials and prospective randomized control trials. Uh, and then the medication reduction uh, was about one drop uh, at two years. Uh, moving on, uh, trabectome. I've never actually seen one of these, uh, but this is an abinternal trabeculotomy using a combination of electrocautery irrigation and aspiration. So same thing, abinterno, um, kind of going over the top of the trabecular meshwork to create a trabeculotomy. Um, so IOP reduction was 6.2 uh, at two years when combined with cataract surgery. And this was just a meta-analysis. There wasn't any, there haven't been any randomized controlled trials. And then medication reduction um, just under one drop uh, at two years. Uh, next, kind of similar, is the Kahook dual blade goniotomy. Uh, so it's an ab internal goniotomy, um, uh, unroofing uh, Schlem's canal. So we have an IOP reduction of about six. Uh, at one year, and this is just a retrospective analysis. There haven't been any uh, randomized control trials. Same thing, about one drop uh, at one year from the retrospective review. Uh, next, we have the Hydrus, which we've just started doing here uh, within the past couple of weeks. Um, so this is an ab internal insertion of this uh, larger kind of micro stent um, that's placed in the Schlem's canal. Um, so here we're getting a higher IOP reduction, 9.4 at two years when combined with cataract surgery. Um, so you can see that, uh, just, oh, let's just have a, I'll just show you on the, sorry about that. So this is actually the, uh, uh, the inlet, so this is actually inserted into the canal, uh, fluid drains from the anterior chamber into Schlem's canal, uh, and eventually out the distal collector channels. Um, next, we have ab internal canaloplasty. Um, so this is, a, this is an ab internal insertion of an illuminated microcatheter. Um, so initially, uh, a cleft is, is created through the trabecular meshwork uh, using an MVR blade. And then this microcatheter is actually inserted into that cleft and then is um, uh, introduced uh, 360 degrees uh, around Schlem's canal and then is slowly withdrawn um, while at the same time uh, injecting viscoelastic to dilate the uh, Schlem's canal and the collector channels. Um, so this can be done as a standalone surgery, so it doesn't require that the patient have a visually significant cataract. Um, and the IOP reduction was about four, and this is a case series review. Uh, medication reduction was one at one year. Uh, and then similar, uh, we have a, what we call a GAT, or a gonioscopic assisted transluminal trabeculotomy. Same thing where a cleft is initially made uh, and, and then uh, the microcatheter is passed through Schlem's canal. And then instead of just withdrawing it directly through, um, the, other end, the other free end is actually grafted as well. And then um, you're basically unroofing the entire trabecular meshwork 360 degrees, creating a direct outflow from the anterior chamber 
um, and bypassing the trabecular meshwork. Um, so this is a you know a, this can also be done as a standalone surgery. IOP reduction on average was about 8.4 at one year. This is also a retrospective review, uh, and then medication reduction was higher at about two at one year. Um, these patients do have a, a higher rate of hyphema, um, and like I said, it can be pretty impressive uh, at times. Um, next, uh, so kind of moving on uh, past the trabecular meshwork, now we're in the suprachoroidal space. So this is uh, the Cypass microstent. Uh, so same thing, inserted ab interno uh, directly uh, between the anterior chamber and the suprachoroidal space. Um, so IRP reduction was about 7.4 when combined with cataract surgery at two years, and this was a randomized control trial. Uh, unfortunately, uh, or fortunately, depending on how you feel about it, uh, this was withdrawn from the global market uh, recently. Uh, after they reportedly showed that there was increased uh, uh, endothelial cell loss when compared to cataract surgery alone. Um, you know, these, these, uh, these have had other issues. It wasn't just that, you know, that they only had endothelial cell loss. Um, the clefts would, would close kind of unpredictably, um, and, and you would get sudden IOP spikes where the patient's pressure would be 8, and then all of a sudden it would be 50 um, the next time that you saw them, and so it was kind of without warning. Um, so those were some of the other issues that you had with that. Uh, and then hypotony was also an issue with this procedure, um, uh, giving a you know fluid tracking around the cyclodialysis cleft um, through the uh, through the stent. So next is a similar uh, eye stent supra. Um, so this is kind of a, a competing device. Um, so this is the same thing. It's kind of inserted ab interno uh, into the suprachoroidal space. Uh, has similar IOP reduction, 7.8 at two years. This is a prospective uh, single-arm clinical trial. Uh, it's approved in Europe. They're using it now, uh, currently waiting FDA approval here in the U.S. Uh, so next, kind of moving on to subconjunctival um, approaches. So this is a Zen gel stent. Um, so same thing, ab interno insertion of a, it's kind of a flexible uh, tube implant um, that allows fluid to, to drain from the anterior chamber uh, into the subconjunctival space forming a bleb. Um, so uh, IOP reduction was nine at one year, medication reduction was almost two at one year. This is a prospective single arm clinical trial. Um, so this kind of outlines how the procedure is done. Um, uh, the issue, one of the biggest issues with these procedures is that the, the needling rates are incredibly high, um, upwards of 50% uh, if, you, if you look at the studies. Um, so these are um, you know, they, they do have their issues, and they have all the issues that you see with uh, bleb formation as well, although they tend to be a lot lower blebs. Um, so next is the in-focus microshunt. So this is a little bit different. It's an ab externo um, subconjunctival insertion, so you still have to do a pretty similar to what you would do with the trabeculectomy. Um, and then uh, this, this uh, tube shunt is, is placed um, through the sclera uh, into the anterior chamber. Um, so the IOP reduction uh, was 16.2 at three years when combined with cataract surgery. Um, so we're, you know, there's a lot of optimism. Um, this might kind of be, um, you know, not, maybe not quite the holy grail of what we're looking at, but, uh, you know, definitely um, better than a lot of the MIGs uh, that we've used uh, so far. So currently they're using this in Canada. Uh, Ike Ahmed is a big proponent of this surgery. That's what he's doing a lot of right now. Uh, and so I'm really excited and hopeful that this will um, get approval here in the U.S. Uh, sooner than later. Um, next is our endocytophotocoagulation, or ECP. So this is now targeting um, uh, aqueous production. So this is an ab interno cyclodestruction procedure of the ciliary body. Um, so up, up to the right, you can see uh, basically you're actually looking at a monitor um, while, you're, while you're inside the patient's eye to, to be able to target. Um, they almost, the ciliary process almost look like little teeth. And as you cauterize them, they kind of shrink up. Um, so it's actually, it's uh, kind of actually a kind of satisfying procedure. You can see that you're actually um, having some impact. Um, unfortunately, the medication, the IOP reduction is, is not great. Uh, it's about two. But in some of these patients that, you're, that have end stage um, or that have glaucoma and you're really hesitant to, um, to, do, to, to do a standard diode procedure, I think this has a great role for these patients. Um, and medication reduction was about one at one year, and this was a prospective case control study. Um, so as far as uh, patient selection, so I think we kind of need to take a mechanistic approach. So the first question you need to ask, does this patient have a cataract 
um, that we that will immediately disqualify uh, some patients from from um, from some of the MIGS procedures that we just spoke of. Um, so if they're only a candidate for standalone MIGS, um, you know that includes the Zen, uh, the In Focus, which we don't have here yet, uh, ab internal canaloplasty, GAT, or ECP. Um, so a lot of the angle surgeries that we just mentioned, um, you know, they don't qualify unless they have a, a, a cataract uh, to do surgery as well. So if they have a lot of conjunctival scarring from previous sur surgeries, such as a scleral buckle, you know, they're not going to be a great candidate for a Zen or an in-focus shunt. Um, maybe we need to consider targeting trabecular meshwork or uveoscleral pathways. You know, some people might argue that MIGS really has no role uh, in a lot of these type of patients, so maybe just a standard tube shunt. Um, would be a better idea in some of these patients. And then is there inflammation present? So same thing, um, you know, these, these patients are gonna do poorly with you know, some conjunctival MIGs uh, if, you're, if you're concerned about a lot of inflammation and in them um, scarring down their blood. Uh, and then ECP, you know, you're, you're intentionally destroying the ciliary processes. So um, probably not a great idea if they're already having a lot of inflammation. Um, is the angle scarred shut due to PAS? So, um, you know, a lot of times, sometimes you can get away with, um, with goniosyniculysis if the PAS have been present within the past year. Uh, but rig MIGs really aren't approved for cocosure glaucoma, uh, but we've been using them here um, after following goniosyniculysis. You can actually get a good view at the angle, and then you can oftentimes still do um, some of these MIGs procedures um, to open things up. Uh, after that's after that's done, uh, and then is there a chemical burn or, or uh, OCP affecting the collector channels? Um, so they're probably not going to be a great candidate for uh, trabecular outflow procedures. You could consider targeting the supraciliary space. Unfortunately, we don't really have any any of those targets right now uh, with the uh, side pass being recalled. Um, so again, kind of these are these are some challenging patients to deal with. Um, so kind of moving on to. Uh, to a case. Um, so this was a 36-year-old monocular patient with juvenile uh, open angle glaucoma. Um, he, he was uh, enucleated. Uh, he had had multiple uh, glaucoma surgeries uh, and then had a tysicle eye. Um, so he, his right eye was enucleated. Um, and his left, uh, left eye, his vision was 20-20. Um, you can see his IOP was 26 on latanoprost, bromonidine, COSOP, or Pressa, uh, kind of you know, kind of on maximum medical therapy. Uh, and then he would had uh, repeatable progression uh, of his superior nasal step on Humphrey visual field testing. He's already had SLT. Uh, he's got a clear lens, open angle. Um, so kind of what would be the next step in management? You can see that he's got a superior nasal step. He's got a dyscheme uh, on exam, and then he's got inferior thinning on OCT. Um, so, you know, are we going to go with the traditional approach and do a trabeculectomy uh, on this 36-year-old? You know, trabeculectomies, uh, you know, they do fail over time. Uh, and so you really want to try to keep as many uh, doors open as possible in, the, in a young patient. So, um, you know, first of all, he's, he's only a candidate for standalone MIGs. Uh, he doesn't have a cataract. Um, so the traditional pathway would, would be a trabeculectomy followed by a tube then maybe a diode. Um, so realistically, you know, this patient's going to live a lot longer than, than probably what those surgeries would, would get him time-wise. Um, so like I said, you need to keep a lot of future surgical options open. Um, so you could consider a standalone angle surgeries. You could do uh, canaloplasty uh, or GAT that would spare his uh, conjunctiva for future um, surgeries. Uh, or you could consider going to a straight uh, a subconjunctival surgery with the Zen or the in focus. Um, so for him, um, he ended up getting a GAT. You could also make the argument of trying a, a canaloplasty, but if you remember, the, the IOP reduction uh, was about four uh, on average in, in patients from that study, so probably not likely to get him where he needs to be. Um, so a GAT was, was chosen for this patient. Um, and as you can see, he's done, you know, he initially had a large hyphema, but then had done very well um, afterwards. IOP was 18 on just Cosopt and Latanoprost. Vision was 20 20. Um, and hopefully, ideally, this patient will, uh, you know, will, will keep his vision uh, for, for the remainder of his life, uh, depending on how long these, these work. Okay, and those are my references. And any any questions that I can take? Yes. 
As you mentioned, several of these MIGs uh, pressure drop about six to eight millimeters combined with cataract surgery. Yeah. Not cataract surgery, just by itself. How much do you get from just taking the cataract down? Yeah, so a lot of, uh, you know, if you look at a lot of the studies, it's uh, between, you know, on average about three and four uh, points. So, you know, uh, that, that people that would argue that uh, minimally effective glaucoma surgeries would, would point that out, that it's really not, you know, not, not a huge pressure reduction that you're getting from a lot of these surgeries in there. You know, they've, uh, they've also done cost analysis on a lot of these um, surgeries, and, um, you know, the companies will, will tout that it is cost effective, but, um, you know, you do feel uh, <laughs> somewhat, I mean, when, when the, when, I mean, when you see how much some of these devices are costing patients, um, it's, and they're, you know, getting minimal benefit um, in a lot of these cases, it's, it's hard to argue um, doing MIGs in, in certain of these, in certain patient populations. Yes. Um, so when some of these devices get recalled, mm -hmm. uh, what happens? I mean, here you've got a device in somebody that's recalled or yep. a problem. I mean, what's the procedure? Yep, so great question. Um, so I can tell you um, there was, so I was on the AGS, uh, the American Glaucoma Society listserv, the day that, that the sign pass was recalled. And the, I mean, it was, there were probably 50 emails uh, from people, from different providers asking, you know, what do we do? How do we, you know, how do we broach the subject with the patients? Uh, and so here, what we've done at the Moran is that we uh, kind of made the decision to notify all, all the patients, track down all the patients that have had a sign pass implanted. And then what we're doing, um, you know, the companies make general recommendations uh, for, um, for what to do. But basically what we're doing is we're, we're bringing all of these patients back in, kind of explaining what this means. Uh, and then we're getting baseline gonioscopy to evaluate the placement of the side pass, see how close it is to the cornea. Because um, presumably, you know, the closer it is to the cornea, the more endothelial cell loss that you're gonna get. And so um, we're getting baseline specular microscopy counts, uh, endothelial counts and then doing a baseline gonio to check the, um, check the position of, of the SIPAS device. And the tricky thing is that um, you know, a lot of these companies, they're saying that it's, it's really easy to just go ahead and trim the SIPAS device, um, but I think that's been a lot more challenging when you actually talk to the people that have tried this. Um, and so that's kind of been a, a source of frustration is that you know, the companies want to say that this is an easy fix, um, but in reality it's not, and they're kind of trying to save face. With this device, so yes, Dr. So this this is actually a, a perfect example of uh, naive thinking on the part of uh, these companies, you know, who are producing these things. It reminds me back in the days when uh, enter chamber intraocular lenses uh, had a whole proliferation of many many different variations on designs of putting enter chamber lenses in. And uh, I remember there was a, a forum, and I can still remember sitting there, and I'd say, but some of these, how are you going to get that thing out? Has anybody thought about that? And the response of, well, our plan is, is that we're not going to have to take it out. Mm -hmm. Well, that's totally naive. I mean, I mean, this kind of stuff is, happens often. I don't think anybody thought this through. I mean, this, this thing, the way it's set up, mm -hmm. and I've talked, Norm's already mentioned, I mean, trying to get this thing out, all those little fenestrations of the rest, you get tissue in the, and I mean, you, you probably have to rip part of the choroid out, try to get it out. Yeah. If indeed it's, it's ultimately causing, you know, significant problems, either in this, this horrendously spiking, hard to control intraocular pressure, which would be a complete failure, right? We're yeah. doing this to control glaucoma, yeah. or the cornea is failing. Yeah. And then the ability to trim it, I mean, they've made it out of material that uh, really? I, yeah. I, I follow that very carefully. I don't think anybody's got a technique really to trim this thing. Right. Yeah. So we've put something in without understanding the full ramifications, without understanding that a hallmark of any bio device is there is a chance you're going to have to get it out. Mm -hmm. And you, that, what's the one? The eye stand supra? Mm -hmm. That's titanium. That's yeah. Saying. <laughs> How, what are you going to do if that thing needs to be? And right. so, and, and I look at it and the rest, I said, well, there's probably a fair possibility. And, you know, I, I don't know, but you look at it that this thing could, doesn't look like there's a strong area where it could be fixed, it could come out. Well, if the titanium part is out and, and there's a chance under with saccades or rubbing your eye that you're hitting the cornea, cornea is going to fail. Yeah. I don't, you know, I don't know how you're going to trim that. So I don't, I don't think. I think we continue repeating some of our same mistakes, and the, the one 
that, that always you have to ask yourself when you're talking about a bio device is, in the chance this fails, which has been shown over and over again to be real, how are you gonna get it out or how are you gonna adjust it? And, and I, think, I think that's a big failure in regards to you know, what people are, are doing in association with these areas. This is a hot area, I mean, it's a real, I mean, a lot of people are saying this is a whole new area of, of surgical glaucoma treatment. And, uh, you know, I, 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 I think that uh, it is exciting, but, but again, people have to consider those particular ramifications of just, you know, what it's gonna mean yep. where we are. I, I think the side pass is, is gonna be a like, a, a, I hope it's not as bad as the Azar lens. I mean, the Azar lens, for those of you who don't remember, was a, <clears throat> a hot lens. This is back when people were doing intracapsular cataract surgery. So they took the whole thing out, didn't have any place else, anterior chamber lenses, and the f hard lenses, which, which did fairly well you know, support the test of time, but they hurt if you touched them because they were hard. And so this particular lens was just, you just slap it in, it was a piece of cake. A lot of people weren't even using operating microscopes and, and that was as easy to stick in there. It was a disaster. It long-term probably has a 100% complication rate and getting that sucker out was just absolutely impossible and it would often rip the eye apart and uh, uh, you know, I, and over time, I, I think side pass is, 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 gonna, is gonna have an increasing issue of problems. So I just, yeah. you know, warn those in the glaucoma side that, uh, that, that a rule that you always need to consider in a bio device is, if you gotta adjust it, how are you gonna do it? And if you gotta get it out, how are you gonna get it out? <laughs> and uh, sadly, I see that being ignored right now. Yeah. Yes? Like you said, a lot of these procedures kind of pop up and then go away and there's always new things coming. From a practice standpoint, when someone's out of training, what's the process for glaucoma surgeons in the community learning to do these new procedures? Yeah, um, so, you know, from what from what I know, uh, from, you know, Roger Furlong, who I'm going to be joining, he's, he's, uh, he's in Missoula, Montana, and so trying to, you know, try, he's far away from an academic center, trying to get um, kind of up to speed on these. I mean, you're kind of relying on the on the surgery reps um, to basically kind of coach you through doing these surgeries. So, you know, the typical um, typical scenario is that you know the rep comes up, they they give a presentation, show show some videos, um, take you to the wet lab, practice on um, you know practice on some model eyes, and then the next day you kind of you try to stack up a number of these types of surgeries um, so that you get some reps in with them. You initially you're followed for the you know the first um, you know, however many number until you feel proficient uh, with that type of surgery. But um, yeah, it's uh, it's very very different. So yeah, I I think it, I, I have the luxury of being in training right now with people that have done a lot of these and and uh, you know that are just amazing surgeons. So that's uh, you know I I feel like that's going to be really challenging once I'm out in practice and uh, and then just kind of you know these uh, dealing with complications and then who to talk to when you're kind of in an isolated place like Montana. There's you know just a handful of glaucoma specialists. In the whole state, uh, and so I think you know keeping a keeping communication and uh, with with our with our teachers here is going to be really really uh, you know important for me going forward for sure. Some of this looks very technically challenging too. Yeah. I mean, some of the so stuff you're proposing, yeah. looking at, said, and, and and when things are are particularly challenging, often I think that that what is being done is not necessarily what had been proposed. <laughs> And that yeah. often results in complications. Yeah. And uh, getting the entry chamber lens, you know, a lot of people did just slap them in and they didn't go where they're supposed to. And so you had, you know, some of those haptics had the whole iris looped around or around the uh, ciliary processes and you had this big keyhole pupil and, and obviously you're going to get erosion and hyphema and the rest. Mm -hmm. So so that's the other thing uh, that, that I look at that and I'm saying, I, I'll, I'll bet you there are a lot of people doing this and that's not where it's going. Yeah, yeah, there's, I think there's definitely a misconception that MIGs are, you know, because it's minimally invasive that it's easy. And uh, I can attest that I've been very humbled uh, by, by learning a lot of these new surgeries. Um, the side pass was probably the, the easiest out of all well, of them. Well, that's what made it popular. Uh, exactly, and so that's one of the biggest issues is because it was so easy, um, you know, we had a lot of, um, you know, a lot of people doing them, and uh, you know, I think, I think that's one of the, the problems with it that we're going to have to deal with. That the glaucoma specialists are going to be the ones kind of dealing with all these issues down the line. 
So. Yes, Dr. Mendelson. Well, we have to finish with a positive spin. So at least some positive things that come out of just the MIGs and the, and the um, surgeries that are in the Clemson Canal. First off, we're not very good gonioscopists, especially in surgery. And one of the things that's good about this is it's teaching us to, to do gonioscopy better, especially surgical gonioscopy. So for residents and for fellows in training, you get a better idea of the anatomy and what's going on. The second thing, though, is it's giving us a better understanding of Schlem's Canal and the drainage of aqueous and what's going on. And I mean, 20 years ago, Murray Johnstone in Seattle was looking at Schlem's Canal and looking at drainage. Nobody paid any attention to it. But at least now, with these mixed devices, we're looking at how the aqueous drains. And, and as people are talking about, you want to try to put these in where you get maximum drainage. And that there is definitely, um, you know, drainage zones that are coming out through Schlem's Canal, and that. Again, when we're doing these procedures, this is going to give us a better understanding, and maybe in the future we'll know exactly where you should put these in and where you get maximum drainage. And so, at least there's a couple of positives, maybe not so much for these devices, but for future devices that, that can come out of this, this type of work that's going on. Rob? Yes. So, I, I think that's a great point. You know, one thing that the, the, the MIGs have really taught us a lot uh, that's been incredibly valuable, as Nick was saying, about just the outflow system and how complicated it is and and you know that if you look at the Goldman equation you know that episcleral venous pressure is just a tacked on value at the end of that equation that's just kind of always there and you know we've discovered with the MIGs that there is absolutely kind of this floor mm -hmm. of pressure lowering that regardless of the MIGs if it's a conventional outflow type of device you, you, we just can't get below that floor and in terms of pressure, you know. And so it's been fascinating to just watch that and kind of learn more about that and try to understand that because it's definitely there. That was the main attraction, I think, of the side pass shunt for us and why a, a number of them got, we have 110 of them here at the Moran that we're putting in. The attraction of it is it's, it's ease of putting it in was big, but the biggest thing is that it was a chance to bypass the conventional outflow system and maybe get away from that you know, pressure floor that we keep hitting with all of the MIGs. And indeed you do. I mean, the, 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 the thing that is just, just so enticing about that side pass is that early on you have these really low pressures, which for so many of these patients, you know, that's what we're aiming for. Uh, but then, then it, it, uh, unfortunately, they blew, some of them blow up, and now we've got the cornea issue, too. So we were really kind of suckered into that, unfortunately. But that was the attraction of it, is bypassing. And, of course, that's what traditional traps and tubes do, is that they are a bypass. You know, we almost call them bypass surgeries now, because they bypass the conventional outflow system. Zen, you know, tries to do that, and, but it, Zen has a whole host of other problems. <laughs> the, the, the in focus, as you mentioned, we're all just just waiting for, um, and uh, those that have access to it feel that it's just fantastic. You showed the number there, you know, 16 millimeters on average lowering, I and mean, that's a whole different ball game compared to the other MIGs. You know, one thing to, to think of about these MIGs, I think, you know, Dr. Harry was mentioning, most of those numbers that, that you show there, a very excellent presentation, most of those numbers that you show are, are 6.2, say, millimeters uh, pressure lowering below a non-medicated baseline. Mm -hmm. you know, most of these studies, they wash out all the medicines yep. first. Um, I, I wish MIGs were better at lowering pressure below the medicated mm -hmm. baseline. If you look at the ice dent and the pivotal ice dent study, for example, it was about a 6.2 millimeter mercury uh, uh, lowering of pressure, but that was an unmedicated baseline. Right. Yep. The amount of pressure lowering below the medicated baseline was Much maybe lower. about one millimeter, yeah. almost just a little less than that. But just doesn't make it look as good when not, you're not presenting quite, yeah, data. Yeah, yeah, no. <laughs> but MIGs have been fantastic in terms of what, and we use them all, and we, we like them all, and, and they've been great to teach us, and, and they're going to continue to be part of it. But uh, Dr. Olson's point is so valid, though. I have tried to get a side pass out of an eye, a one that it actually extruded out, I probably from some eye rubbing or something like that, that extruded out about, about you know, week one, or I think it was maybe day 10 or something like that. And so I went back in. I could not get that out, nor could I trim it with any scissor that was available to me. So that was ex and is extraordinarily discouraging, just specifically about the side pass. Yeah. So, you know, that, that, that's an unfortunate thing. And, and we do have to be absolutely mindful. You know, 
for one thing about an Ahmed valve or a bear, bear valve valve, I can get those out. Yeah. I can get those yeah. out. Anytime it needs to come out, I can get it out. Uh, you know, yeah. and I've had to remove some food, mm -hmm. but this side pass shunt, mm -hmm. it was scarred in there. It was no way. <laughs> and I don't know, I've never tried to remove a Zen, but you know, it, it's you know, it's again it's gonna get tacked down right at its point of entry <laughs> through this glare and, and in focus, you know, I, I don't know. We'll, we'll see. But we, I hope in focus is as good as build because we're all Yeah, we've I've uh, I've taken a Zen out. It's I mean it was it was almost hard to find because it was so enveloped in tenons and it's such a tiny little stent. Um, so yeah, they just get completely encapsulated. And once you actually got it and grabbed it, were you <coughs> able to? Uh, we were able. Yeah, we were able to pull it out. Yeah. Um, yeah, you could. You could also trim it right up against the square. I guess if you could. Yeah, that's but, nothing. You can actually um, trim it as end, but yeah. 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 Here's the risky. Yeah. If we end up doing EKs on these side pass patients, is there like major issues with air going into that superciliary space? I don't know. I don't think so. I, yeah, I don't think so. I, I, Some viscoelastic in the side yeah, pass. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, you know, I've actually gone in on one of the side pass shunts that I had that had this kind of catastrophic kind of pressure spike. Um, I actually went in and, and, and injected viscoelastic into the shunt itself to just try to revitalize it, and it seemed like it worked for a while. Um, not that, not that much. But I, I really don't think that, uh, as an air exhaust, so to speak, that it'd be a problem for you. I don't, I don't think so. It's fascinating stuff. Thank you. Thanks.